everyone, and welcome to episode 101 of the Malthouse Games podcast. My name is Delton. I will be your host today, and with me as usual is my lovely wife and yellow player, Haley. I'm starting a peer support group for those who are still processing having heard our first episode last week. It was a surprising uh, revelation to play that, just to hear how we were. Yes, I agree completely. Those episodes really are vastly different than what we have now. Yes, and we are ready for 100 more episodes starting today and starting with a beer. What you got for me, Delty Poo? Uh, The first beer today for episode 101 is Stilly Wheat from Iron Monk Brewing up in Stillwater, Oklahoma. This is their wheat beer. Stilly is what people call Stillwater for short a lot of times, usually losers and people who went to college there. Okay, hold on, hold on. I went to college there. I was there for four years. Nobody ever called it Stilly. Really? Nobody. I I never referred to it as Stilly. Nobody who actually lived there ever referred to it as Stilly. Now, maybe if you were coming in from out of town trying to tailgate for the weekend and relive your college days or, I don't know, just hang out and get drunk, then yes, you call it Stilly because you can't say Stillwater too many syllables. Don't talk about your parents like that. Ah. Uh, anyway, Stilly was not something that was usually said, but... Iron Monk is from Stillwater, does say Stilly, and in fact, does make a great beer. So Stilly Wheat is a wheat beer. Um, You know, I was hoping that I would start talking and then look at the can. 4.5 alcohol by volume. It is a Belgian-style wheat ale. Uh, That's pretty much it. And I've had this before. In fact, I had this with dinner tonight. It is a meal and a beer. We have had this beer a lot, I feel like. But not on the podcast, which is surprising. That's very true, actually. Uh, It's a nice, like, cloudy, cloudy, hazy yellow. It has that bit of a wheat tang in the smell. Very yeasty, sweetie, delicious. very much so. A little bit of a tartness to it from the wheat. But it's a very good beer. It's simple. It's clean. You just get that little bit of a tart and a pretty dry finish. And thing is, it's it's not a heavy beer. No. But it's a filling beer. Yes, it is. It's, it's kind of like whenever you've eaten a couple of slices of really good homemade bread. You're not full, but you are satisfied. Full but satisfied. That's where everyone wants to be. So, Delty, what you been up to the last couple of weeks? Uh, well, the last couple of weeks have had not a ton of stuff happen. I have started back watching horror movies again. I watched the original 1974 Black Christmas, which was a very good. I watched the original Carrie which was okay. The first 45 minutes I did not like. Uh, the you second just don't 45, like John Travolta. I really don't. In that movie, he was a dickhead. Uh, and then I liked the second 45 minutes better. Still wasn't amazing. Like, the thing is, comparing that movie for me to, like, Black Christmas, Black Christmas was just way better, in my opinion. Trivia fact, Carrie's date and Carrie has the same haircut Delton had at age 16. I mean, pretty much, except I didn't feather mine. It was just curly. It was kind of naturally feathered. You were blessed. A a little bit, maybe. You were blessed. But yes, uh, that movie was fine. And then I also watched Malignant, the new movie, which I've talked with Cody. And I've talked a little. uh, David has chimed in and Alan. Uh, I don't recommend unless you're the kind of person that enjoys a goofy, almost for the reason of being goofy horror movie. It tries to be serious, but it's too funny. Some gorgeous cinematography, some cool shots, some pretty bad dialogue and pacing. But all in all, it was fun. You are not selling that movie at I'm not, all. I'm not trying to sell it. I'm just trying to say this is what needs to be. This is a movie. And then I also finally watched the Fear Street Trilogy. trilogy, tr- trilogy. Uh, I was chilling while watching it. The trilogy of the Fear Street movies on Netflix First one, in my opinion, is the weakest. Second is the strongest. First half of the third is probably the next strongest for me. Um, But all in all, a very good experience. You have to get about halfway through the first one to really get into it, I feel like. But once they aren't trying to throw the 90s in your face super hard, uh, it really opens up and is a very cool trilogy, and I really enjoyed it. It was really interesting hearing a Trent Reznor song during an R.L. Stein movie. Well, here's what's so funny, too, and Brian pointed this out. Um, the kid is typing on AOL. It's supposed to take place in 94. AOL didn't release till 97. Ooh, continuity error. 
and then I was thinking about it, and they were playing Closer by Nine Inch Nails in the mall. I think that did release in 94, but there's potential that it would be 95 or 96. I don't remember when Downward Spiral came out, that album. But anyway, a few small things in the beginning there, but I think that that has to do with uh, trying to emphasize, hey, this is the 90s, look at us, the 90s. Uh, the rest of them, to me, don't have that same issue. But Just essence of 90s. It's also nothing I really noticed. I didn't mind, because I didn't know when AOL came out. You know what I mean? Like, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of the internet at that point. But anyway, watched those. What else have I done? We had Zach and Sarah over. We had Zach and Sarah come over and hang out with us and bring the baby. And we were reinforced in our idea or our decision to not have kids because during baby's visit, she got her first taste of espresso and first Band-Aid, thanks to the Twyman Brack household. Thanks to Steve. Thanks to Steve. So the, the espresso, I put a little in the dessert, and they worked around it. She, I don't think she actually had any, but Steve did attack and be a Steve. That's what he's good at. So the baby was standing up at the table, kind of like my niece did whenever she was younger. And Steve was hiding under there, just wham, knocked the baby down, scratched her, got her first Band-Aid, cleaned it up. Steve went to the bedroom. Uh, but Sarah was saying, you know, baby didn't even see what happened. She didn't see it was Steve. Thank goodness. She, she, she will not develop a fear of cats. and said, great, instead of developing a specific phobia, she'll develop generalized anxiety. Just like, what's happening? Something's going to happen bad. It's going to happen. Something's going to come out of nowhere and scratch me. Yes. So, yeah, we, we're, we're not having kids. We got too many cats. <laughs> Exactly. But that was a good time hanging out with him that weekend, relaxing, hanging out, watching TV and just visiting and catching up and going to the zoo. That was fun. That was a lot of fun. It was great just to catch up with them and hang out. And then, gosh, you know, it's been about three weeks since we've recorded, right? It has because we recorded like a week early before the weekend they came up. That way I could get everything knocked out a lot more easily and not have to worry about recording around the time they're coming and editing. And I was able to just get it done faster. So that was really nice. And I'm sure next episode we're going to come back with some antics because I'm going to the Oklahoma State Fair with my niece on Saturday. Uh, yeah, that one's going to be a bit wild. Uh, be safe. <laughs> <laughs> that was my uh, opinion today about it was just I'm not going to go. There's no way I'm going to step in foot or step a foot in that state fair. But I know y'all are going to Disney on ice for Lakin. For Lake and Bake. I will do anything for Lake and Bake. We're going to get her face painted. We're going to get her a funnel cake, get her sugared out, take her to Disney on ice, let her take a nap. That all sounds good to me. Well, before we go into the game, I'm going to go ahead and knock out a couple announcements and things like that so you can hear them right at the beginning of the show before it really gets started. Uh, first, I have to find my phone now because I need to confirm that the Patreon list is exactly the list I'm thinking it is of who I need to thank for becoming a backer. And I think that it is going to stay the same. Yes, so that means it's a big thank you to Allison, Alan, Jesse, Catherine, Jennifer, and Cliff for backing it at a level in which you get shouted out on the podcast. Woo! Now, remember, and I announced this last time and a little on social media, but I need to uh, go ahead and post a little bit more before October. If you are a Patreon backer at the $5 or higher level when October charges on the 1st, you will be getting a beer glass shipped to you that we are having delivered sometime this month. I have not heard yet, but it's supposed to be before the end of the month. If you already are getting one from September's charge date, uh, you can't get two. So I'm pretty sure all of our patr patrons right now will not be getting a second one. But anybody new who signs up from here until then, uh, and it charges successfully on October 1st, will be receiving a beer glass. Um, I will basically message everybody. Uh, through Patreon, unless I know you personally, and I can say, hey, can I just set this on your porch? And I will be shipping out beer glasses once they come in. I'm very excited for that. We will hunt you down, and we will find you, and we will give you a beer glass. Exactly. So go to, go to patreon.com slash malthousegames, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S games. If you want to check out our Patreon levels, things like that, you can also go to malthousegames.com if you want to just see the other episodes we've done, what games we covered, some of that stuff. And we're also happy to announce uh, that we are now opening... How, how did I... Shop.malthousegames.com There we go. Shop.malthousegames.com is our Teespring store where we can upload imagery. Right now it is our regular logo and our winter logo. And you can order t-shirts. Fanny packs. 
I believe the most expensive t-shirt I have set is the Tri-Blend Super Soft at $20, not including shipping and tax, which I do not dictate those things. Um, there's a fanny pack. Hella fanny packs. 22 there's, colors of fanny packs. There's a lot of colors on the fanny packs that you can do, but the shirts are regular cotton, a V-neck, and the premium super soft. I have women's styles, men's styles, so basically whatever I could get for any, any way you like your t-shirt to fit, hopefully you can find it. Uh, we are hoping to, in the future, get some like neat ideas that we can throw on this or throw on that. And I also have a beer glass on there that you can purchase that's going to be different than what we're sending out because we're sending out 100th episode special ones. Um, I think that that's it. So that's shop.malthousegames.com. Get you a fanny pack. I think that's all the announcements. I can't think of anything else. I'm really excited for the shop. I know that I'm biased because it's our logo, but Delton did a really great job, and I hope you guys check it out, and I hope you like it, and I hope you got some sweet malt house swag to support. It just makes it easy because instead of me having to be like, hey, I want 50 t-shirts, here's a giant lump sum of money, I'm going to store them in my back bedroom, and I'm going to mail them as people want them, which is just like taxing for us, it's easy that it's essentially print on demand. Takes about a week and a half is what the average timeline has been. Um, and they've been good enough quality. I was happy with the quality. So, yeah, very happy about that. But, yes, with that being said, let's move to the game to get this episode going forward. Oh, here's the door. Uh, uh. It's straight ahead. It's it's a game. So I'm really excited to talk about today's game, Delty Poo. I am, too. This game was sent to us. This is a review copy from One More Time Games out of Austria, uh, out of Vienna, actually. Österreich. This game is Rift Force. It's a brand new game that is releasing in the U.S. I believe it is officially announced now. Capstone Games, who published Pipeline, and I believe brought over, I'm going to say Maracaibo. Yes, I see their logo on Maracaibo. They've been bringing some games from Europe and being the United States publisher. Well, Capstone has picked up Rift Force from One More Time Games, and at Gen Con, which is happening right now through this weekend, uh, Gen Con in Indianapolis is like the official release of it, and it will be available to order through Capstone, I believe, from this point on. I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me, essentially. So Rift Force is designed by Carlo Bordellini, illustrated by Miguel Coimbra. Graphic concept is Elena Anna Riser. Graphic icons is Kristen Shoup. Graphic print is Adelier198. That is the same company that Clemens Franz works with a lot, I think, from what I can remember. Uh, developer is Matteo Lindner. Consultant cultural sensitivity is Calvin Wong. And the video animator is Tobias Lamp because they have a video you can look up that's all about their game. So in this game, uh, it's actually very simple. I'm looking at the box here. It is two players only. It is ages 10 and up, and it's about 30 minutes, and I think it took us like 22, 23. Yeah, it was pretty quick. And that was a learning game, so I was happy with that. Um, the way the game uh, plays is it is a card-based game that's going to function where you and your opponent are competing across some sort of dividing line in the middle of the table. So for an example of a game like this is going to be Lost Cities. It's going to be Battle Line. It's going to be, I think, Shot and Totten some of those older card games. Um, so it's a similar style that you'll sort of be used to if you've played any of those games specifically. Uh, so on the game, there's going to be five locations in the middle. You on one side, the other a player on the other. And what happens is uh, the first thing that happens in the game is there's a draft. And this is something that I enjoy when games draft. Every single time I enjoy it because it makes you change the game up. The game's always a little different, and I just find it fun to play with different things. So in the game, it is card-based, and there are 10 different guilds in the game. One summoner, which is like, hey, this is what your guild's abilities are, and uh, nine elemental cards ranging from different numbers, basically different... Uh, is it just five sixes and sevens? Yes, five sixes and sevens. What is it? Three fives, two sixes, one seven? No. Uh that I don't know. I think it's four, three, and two. Would that add up N to nine? Yes. I think it's two sevens, three sixes, four fives. I'm going to say that without confirming because I'm smart. Yep, I'm right. Ha ha, confirmed. I'm so good. Anyway, <laughs> so uh, the different, um, these different sets, different guilds are essentially elements. You have fire, earth, light, plant, water, ice, shadow, crystal, thunderbolt, and air. 
I think it's kind of funny that it's thunderbolts and not just electricity or electric or something. That's kind of an interesting take to me. Don't be like static. We want to be powerful, like a lightning bolt, not like yeah. I rub my feet on the carpet. Zip. <laughs> Zip. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> it. Uh, so the way the game's going to work is uh, the two players are on either side of these five locations in the middle of the table. Uh, you will essentially draft from these 10. You'll take one out at random. You will draft until each player has four that they control. Then you will discard the remaining one. So there's always going to be two of these guilds that are not in play, which means you can try different little combos with the cards as you go. Uh, from there, you'll do the little starting thing, draw up your hand, and the way the game works is there's three things you can do on your turn. You can either play, you can activate, or you can check and draw. And these are very simple. Play is playing cards from your hand. The thing I like is this game does a what I found to be a little bit unique, which is the cards you play from your hand, or when you activate cards, is all based on either the fact the uh, guild I keep wanting to call it a faction the guild they are so the element earth wind fire or the value of the card so if you want to play cards from your hand you can play up to three all of those cards must either have the same symbol so be part of the same guild so they're all water or all of those cards must be the same value such as they're all sixes when you play them you can either play all three at one location or they each have to go in a different location, but they all have to be adjacent. So essentially, the rightmost, next to that, and then next to that. So that's how you play cards out to the field. Some of these guilds have things that when they enter the battlefield, or when you place them at a location, something happens. Like, boom, you immediately do a damage to one of your opponent's uh, little guild people, uh, elementals. I don't know why I keep struggling with the terminology here. Uh, you deal damage to their elementals. Then you have the activate ability which what that is, is you discard a card from your hand and then you can activate up to three elementals, and again, that are either the same guild, so the same element, or the same value. So three of your fives on the board get to activate or three of your sixes or, you know, three of your fire elementals get to activate, which does some kind of ability. The last thing that you get to do is check and draw. And what that does is if you have an elemental at a location, and your opponent has no opposition there, you will gain one Rift Force, which is one victory point toward the end of the game, and you will draw up to your max hand size of seven. And you will play back and forth on this game until somebody reaches the 12 Rift Point mark. At that point, whoever, once the round is over, whoever is the winner is the winner, and if it's tied, you keep going until somebody wins. And that's something that I misunderstood the first time we played. I thought it was the first person, the 12. And so I like dumped my hand and like raced to the end. I was like, yeah, I made it to 12. And Dalton's like, I still get to finish my turn. No. And so I ended yeah. up losing the first time that we played. Yes, because I happened to win tie after tie after like we were tying around and then we would tie. And it just worked out where I was able to do a check and draw, gain like three points, draw some cards. And that was able to secure victory for me. Which that was on me because I misunderstood whenever he was explaining. And that's that's an easy rule to miss because most games it's like you tie and then it goes to tiebreaker. But this was like, no, you keep playing until someone loses. So I really liked uh, how you can, you basically pick two different guilds, two different factions to combine to your deck. So I had like, what was it, like the psychic one and the... You had shadow. Shadow. Light, which you never utilize light. Fire, which kept hurting your own guys unless you weren't careful, which you were good about. And then I think you had water as yes, well. Yes, that's it. I think those were your four. Those are my four. But uh, I really enjoy it because every time you play, like you're, you're probably not likely to get the same factions every time because each time you play, you take out two of the factions, take out two of the guilds. And so it's very unlikely that you're actually going to get the same four every time you play, depending on who you play with. Unless like something magical happens and the other opponent only takes their original four guilds and you only take your four original guilds. And so it changes it up constantly, but it doesn't change necessarily the game. But your strategy changes. And you guys know that I like a lot of change in strategy. I like to be on my feet. I like to have to think as I go. And so for this one, I like how none of the factions are built to go together, but they are. They all go together really yes. well. They all can complement each other. Very well. It just depends on how you play and how you use strategy. It's very true. And that's what I like is, A, with the drafting, 
you get to decide, all right, I'm going to play some different little ability thing here. So for example, Haley said they're not built to play together, but they kind of are all built to be able to play together. So as an example, uh, Crystal, and let me see, there's Crystal and Plant. Did I leave those out when I said the list of them? No, I did. Okay, that just, I brushed right over that. Because I remember I had Ice, Crystal, Plant, and Earth, I think were mine. Or maybe it was, maybe it was, uh, I don't know, maybe I had Thunderbolt. I can't remember what two were out. But uh, one of my favorites was Earth. What I like is the Earth is the only elemental that triggers immediately when you play it. And for each Earth, uh, each played Earth in a location, it deals one damage on each enemy at the same location immediately. So you put the Earth down and it immediately triggers and, you know, hits everybody on the other side. Well, then another one that I had was the crystal. Oh, I see. I'm, I'm over here looking at the FAQ, wondering why I can't see the rule. The other one I had was the ice. And ice had a thing where it was like, you can deal so much damage to uh, the last enemy. I believe it was the last enemy in the, on the opponent's side, their last elemental. However, if it already has damage, it deals like four instead of one. So with the earth being played, it just hit it with damage immediately. So my next turn, I activate ice and boom, I just take out the far back enemy. And I liked having that little combo. Uh, the fire can damage your own people, but they're very strong. There's all kinds of different neat abilities with them, but there's ways to like that ice and earth to tie them together and do something just like a little neat that feels a little combo-y was like really nice to, to find ways to make that all work out. Yeah, because if you have earth that damages, but you pair that with the sun that heals you, then you can really play off those really well. Yeah, because you had those, uh, you had the fire mm -hmm. that damaged you, and then fire, your yeah. light characters that would heal your own damage. Yeah. Yeah, so that was really cool, because you're like, all right, I'm going to activate fire here and do some damage, activate this and do damage, and then that's going to trigger my light guy, which will take off a damage. And what's really awesome is you can use the shadow guy to really tick off your opponent. Yes. The shadow has this ability of dealing damage and then moving to another location frustrating 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 and it deals damage when it moves i believe as well um i would have to look exactly what the what the wording is on that card but the box is too far away but the shadow ones were very neat because they moved a lot and they did strong damage when they moved but they were very frustrating to play against unless you just piled up and killed them immediately and i feel like we're, we're kind of sounding all over the place as we describe this yeah. but there's just what there's 12 factions 10 factions there are 10 different guilds there's 10 different guilds and we like all of them. So, like, as we're talking yes. about them, I know that we're, like, throwing, like, here's a description of ten different guilds at you right at once. But it's really fun. It's really easy once you have the box in front of you. The cards are laid out where it's easy to understand, you know, what your uh, cards can do, you know, what yep. your powers are. And so even, like, like I said, the first, very first time we played this, we sat down from starting to learn it to finish playing it. It was 22 minutes. Yeah, it was really fast because it's just, it's a simple game to understand how to play. But it was one of those that, uh, you know, there's enough going on that it's like, cool, I get to think of these different ideas. As a kid, I was really a fan of those, like, really cheap board games you get from uh, Walmart or Target that was like 20 games in one. Like, you flip the board over, yep. and it's like uh, checkers, you flip the board over, it's chess, or like, as tic-tac-toe, and like, all these random games. That's what this does. I feel like you can play multiple different kinds of games with this because depending on what guild you have, you have a whole different set of strategy and powers. It's still the same premise, but you're playing a very different game depending on what uh, characters you have. And I like that. Oh, definitely. Like one of the things I feel like we didn't do a lot of, you'd have the shadow that moved around. What we didn't have was the air that moved around a lot as well. I had the plants, but felt like I never really utilized them. The plants are able to. Uh, pull people to their location and so they can like disrupt your opponent's setup and then there's another one that also moves the enemy or maybe moves themselves so something we didn't play with was like somebody that went heavy move strategy where they're all over the place moving your people moving their people i feel like that would be a fun way to play also um there's there is there's just so many styles and small little combos that you can try to weave together with this that I think it's one that uh, has a pretty high replayability. Yes. And even with all the description that we've given, basic concept is 10 factions. You each get four. They make a deck. On your turn, you either draw or you check. You can either check and play. draw, check and draw, play, or activate. 
check and draw, play, or activate. And that's it. That's that's your turn. It's really simple, really easy, but really fun and a lot of strategy. It is. It's a very good one. Uh, the artwork also is really neat. It's just these neat looking elementals, very bright colors, looks good on the table, easy to identify between the, the guilds. I thought that was nice because you never know with some games, uh, like the closest you could probably get is some of the like the earth and the light are both sort of a yellow tone, but this is super bright yellow and this is like a dark brown tan. So you're not going to mistake cards for other cards by the artwork, I think. Uh, I just think they did a really good job, and we had a lot of fun with it. It's one I'm looking forward to introducing to Brian. Yes, highly recommend. Five stars, two clinking glasses. Clink, 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 Oh, do we need to clink glasses on it? Clink, clink. But yeah, so that is Rift Force from One More Time Games, being brought to the U.S. by Capstone Games. It's a little game with a lot of strategy. Hey, what can I get you? I'd like a topic. Any special way? Make it a top shelf topic. Coming up. Enjoy. So before we get into the topic of this episode, let's pour the next beer. This beer is one that we brought back from Oregon when we went and stayed with Jennifer and Nick for Gen Con. Hi, friends. This is from Block 15 Brewing Company. This is Fluffhead, an IPA uh, brewed and canned at Block 15 Brewing Co. in Corvallis, Oregon. That is 6.5% alcohol by volume, and this is a 16-ounce tall can. Fluffhead is a fruity, hazy IPA that balances a soft malt body with copious dry hop additions. Flaked oats and English yeast produce a fluffy, round body while generous late addition hopping with mosaic uh, chinook and azica delivers pungent notes of tangerine, papaya, and spruce. There you go. I feel like I struggled reading that. Again, it's a like a light green on a green. I feel like you're also reading the ingredients in a poopery container. Uh, yes. A poopery? A poopery. You mean a potpourri? A poopery. Ow. What happened? I popped it. Ow. Yeah. Yay. I'm struggling over here today. Hey, that's okay. I'm excited for this one. The can looks glorious. It does. Oh, I can... So- Holy jeez. Go oh, jeez, Rick. <laughs> We've got Garrett saying that at work now. Garrett says, oh, jeez, all the time. And I said, why do you sound like Morty so much? He said, oh, jeez, Rick. And, uh, yeah, that's been a thing now. Look at that golden color. So Delton poured mine second, his first, and his was very clear and mine was very hazy. He just added the last few drops to his and it just clouded his up crazily. I should have tilted it upside down and then back over. Oh, wow. That smells wonderful. Uh, Okay, so here's the thing. I hate the smell of grapefruit and this reminds me of grapefruit. It smells like grapefruit and pine needles. Yeah. Wow. There is a lot of pine in that. Uh, it got a nice little head on it. It's got a cloudy, cloudy, like really light blonde color. Mm. That is a pungent, punch you in the oh taste my buds god. IPA. I just got punched in the tongue. That's exactly what this one does. Oh my god. Okay, it sounds bad, but it has an aftertaste of pine needles and I really like it. It does. It has an, an awkward, I say awkward, it's an odd aftertaste of pine kind of a what's the i don't know when you smell a cedar tree right right that's just exactly yeah, what it tastes it, yeah. it tastes like a cedar tree tastes smells like a cedar tree smells that is wild it's it is very they said fluffy it is very like mm-hmm. fluffy uh it's a, it's not thick necessarily and it's not overly carbonated but it's got a body to it and even when it finishes it lingers a minute it almost feels like there's a little bit of oil hanging around. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was not expecting that to be that way. Because normally, like, IPAs kind of peak, and then you're kind of left with, like, a, yeah. a bitter, almost. This, this one, one hangs out. It hangs out. It's like, hey, I'm here. It's, it's dank. It's dank. There you go. Uh, it's a very good one, though. Like, I like this. This reminds me so much of a very popular IPA here, which is F5. Because F5 was, like, the punch-you-in-the-face IPA in Oklahoma craft scene that came up and everyone was like, oh, wow, we can do what with IPAs? And this reminds me of that uh, level, except I feel like this has cranked it further, you know? But it's really good. So that's Block 15 Fluffhead, IPA out of Oregon. Approved. I like that. I also like the can. So the topic for today, as Haley alluded to in her transition that you probably forgot about by now, 
is essentially strategy in simple games or small games. But we had the idea of a game like Rift Force here that Rift Force is a simple game to understand, a simple game to play, like very, very simple. But there is strategy to it, and the strategy is what drives the game forward. It's all about how you decide where to place your people, what value of your you know, elementals are you placing, when do you activate their abilities, how much do you stack up versus spread out, when do you decide to check and draw up your hand, all of that good stuff. Uh, that's kind of a big thing in games that I think we enjoy. We really like when it's a simple to play game with high strategy. And the thing is, it's not like we don't like complex games. But one of the things to keep in mind is there are different forms of complexity, right? So one of the games that's one of the simplest games that has very high strategy, you could say, is chess. I always make the argument that chess is majority memorization because the, it's, every move has been mapped out. Those moves all have counters. It's a lot of memorization. However, that is a game that you simply move. These pieces move in this very simple way. This piece just moves in an L shape. This piece is diagonal. But within that, there is strategy of planning, of trying to calculate what your opponent's going to play, how you're going to be prepared to counter these plays, and what do you think they're going to do based on positioning. That's like the most simple version of an, a simple game with deep strategy. Yes. But what we're kind of going for in this topic is not only simple games as in like, okay, this is just a, a simple like looking game, but what are, what's simple to teach, what's simple to learn, and what's, what's small too. Yeah, the footprint on this one, when you're playing the game, it does take up a little bit of table space. But all in all, this is just a deck of cards with some tokens. Yes. So it's not like there's a lot of components, but what you're getting out of those components is what's so good. Yeah. It's good components, easy to teach, easy to learn, but lots of strategy. Yes. So one that I really think meets this category is Bonanza. Bonanza is such a good but interesting game. Yeah, so the first time I played Bonanza, like we probably learned it in like five minutes or so. And it's a little card game. It's like a, a deck of cards. But there's so much strategy in it because, I mean, basically all it is is it's set collection and it's land management. You got to make sure you have enough plots to be able to plant your beans. And you got to have enough beans to turn them in for profit. And so that's basically the premise. But you also, as you're uh, collecting your cards, you can't put them out of order. You know, you have to have sold your plots to have room for more beans. So it takes a lot of planning. It takes a lot of watching. And it takes a lot of watching your opponent, too, to try to figure out what are they going to take next. And so there's a lot of strategy, even with that little card game. And one thing with uh, Bonanza as well is there is, now given... I should probably specify that we play Bonanza the Duel. Uh, we have the full version, but we play the, the, the two-player variant. They actually have a full boxed game you can get that's just the Duel. But in normal Bonanza, there is trading with other players. In this version, it's like a forced trade where you have to trade cards by putting them on the table, and your opponent has a choice whether to take them or not. So that's something to keep in mind. But something that Bonanza has and Rift Force have at the same time, is trying to sort of figure out what your opponent's going to do. Like, that's kind of a big element to that game. And I think that that's the same thing I see in Azul, of why I think Azul fits in the same category as Rift Force as a simple-to-teach game. It's a simple game, but it has a lot of strategy to it because in Azul, with your drafting of the different tiles to put on your board, you're trying to think about Who's going to take what? Where do I think they're going to take these from? If I take this from here, can I force someone to do that? That way I can do this. You're trying to figure out the opponents and what their actions are, are going to be. And I feel like that's one big element of a simple but strategic game is some of the strategy isn't just what pieces I'm putting down and how I'm doing all this stuff. It's how is my opponent going to respond how can I intercept what they're trying to do? Or how can I figure it out so I can be prepared? And so for me, I think what kinds of games meet this category is that they are, what makes them simple is that they're simple to teach. There's not a lot of components. You're not having to focus on three boards, two mats, three different dice, four different tiles. Like it's simple components, simple to teach, but it's something that keeps your mind engaged when it's not your turn. You know, because something like, I don't know, Skip Bow. 
skip boat, you can like put your hand down, not even think about it. You can walk off for 20 minutes and come back and it's still not your turn and you can pick up your cards and you can go. But something like Rift Force, it is like skip boat, a deck of cards. But when it's not your turn, you, you have to be engaged. You have to strategize. You have to figure out, okay, what is my opponent doing? How am I going to respond? And how can I milk my opponent for all the points they're worth? So what meets this criteria for you, Delty Poo? Uh, I think that you've kind of hit the nail on the head, right? Being able to teach the game and make sure someone understands how to play very efficiently and quickly and simply, and then having enough strategy in the game that between turns and, you know, at pretty much all times, you're observing and thinking and planning and figuring all that out. So I think there is a big uh, mental aspect to that. And I think that that's going to be the big kicker there. Because if you play something that's a very complex game that has a lot of strategy, like, uh, let's say, Agricola, there's all kinds of working parts back and forth, this and that. But it's more of figuring out how these parts can work together in the most efficient way more so than it is figuring out what your opponent's working on, how they're moving things around to make sure you can counter that. And I think that that's where the big difference between simple and complex come in, is simple games tend to have fewer things to think about in terms of like physical components and physical moving parts, but the strategy comes from observing your opponents and how they're moving their parts and how you're moving yours and trying to plan that out. So I think that it's something to do with that mental component, that direct uh, concern and direct interaction with your opponent during the game. And so for you, uh, like that that, uh, interpersonal uh, connection, like having to watch the other player, that's something that adds complexity to you. That adds all the strategy in. That is the complexity. All the complexity in the game is having to develop your strategy of observing your opponent. So yeah, I would say for a simple game that has a lot of strategy, for me, it's having to have that interpersonal connection with the opponent, as you put it, where you are watching what they're doing and trying to figure out how to best play against that. Not necessarily, you know, figuring out a puzzle. So I think I think that's kind of it. Which I think we both agree on, by the sounds of it. I think so too. Which is good. And that's a lot of abstract games. You know, Gip and Chess and Checkers and I've got Zerts and I'm kind of blanking on many more. The Duke, games like that. A lot of that is what is my opponent going to do, Onitama. Uh, and that's where a lot of the strategy comes into those games. And I kind of feel like the crew falls into that as well. The crew does, even though you're all working together. Yeah, yes. the, 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 the strategy of that game is what, is, what are my friends going to do? And it's very simple to teach. It's very simple to learn. Yep. It's very, like, theoretically speaking, simple to play. Yep. But it's difficult to win. There's a lot of strategy involved in that. Definitely so. So I think that that kind of is a, it's a nice area of a game to be. I guess another game that has a play style similar to Rift Force that we actually got from Nick and Jennifer, thank you all so much, is Air, Land, and Sea that we played at their house. That was the one where you're playing on the different, you know, zones there. Um, it's a similar style game where it's kind of the same thing. What are they going to do and how can I play this to make sure to affect that? Um, yeah. So I think that's a pretty good definition there or a good um, a good approach to a simple but strategic game uh, that Rift Force really... I mean, and that's the funny thing, right? Is every time we review a game on the podcast, we have to... That game usually gives us something to talk about. Like, what does this game do that we can bring up to have some kind of conversation. And for this one, it was, it's a really easy game to sit down and play, but there's a lot of strategy in how you play it. And I think that this is just one of those games that that sounds like fun to you. Again, this is a, Rift Force is a good way to go. Pick it up. With that being said, let's move to the question and then wrap this episode up. And now, join us for a Malthouse Games Podcast special by size question. So the question for today is directly related to Rift Force and how it uses elementals in the guilds. What would be your element if you were some sort of elemental? Or, as I put it earlier, if you were a bender in the Avatar universe, uh, what would you bend? I really want to say sun, but I know that with my complexion that would not be the case. (laughs) 
I do not harness the you power of the sun. Move the sun, or do you mean light from Rift Force? Light from Rift Force. <laughs> Any light? I, I want to say light, but I really think at the end of the day, I'm probably wind. Yeah. Full of hot air. I'm light and fluffy. There you go. Just float around all over the place. I float around. Not a care in the world. I am wind. I There's always something fun about Earth and rocks and things like that. Uh, if I want to go really into the Avatar war- universe, frickin' bloodbending was the coolest thing, even though I know it was only evil people that did it. Um, that's by far one of my favorite things I've seen in that show. Uh, anyway, uh, I think Earth, though, on a basic level, I think Earth would be very cool. So there you go. There's our elements. Nice and simple. Easy peasy to the point with that question. Pick up Rift Force so you can figure out which element you are. Yeah, so thank you again to One More Time Games for sending us a copy of Rift Force to review. Uh, It's now going to be published in the U.S. through Capstone Games, so make sure and uh, pick that one up. We really like it as a two-player, as we've talked about this whole show. Uh, It's worth checking out. With all that being said, we did our Patreon shoutouts at the beginning, but one thing I did not mention is uh, we have actually made one change to the podcast which you might have been able to hear this episode and there's one change coming next week the change you might be able to hear this episode is Haley is using a brand new audio technica bp40 broadcast microphone as if my voice couldn't get any better uh essentially i am trying to figure out what microphones to upgrade to because the microphones we use for as good as they are and as easy to use as they are Uh, They do lack a bit of clarity in the voice, and I would like to upgrade just to one more level up to be on par with all the other big podcasts I listen to out there. Haley's Microphone, uh, I'm a big fan of Audio-Technica. All of my mics at this point are Audio-Technica. They've always treated me well. They've had good build quality, and I've enjoyed them a lot, as well as their price points. Uh, Haley is using their broadcast mic. I found that in my testing, it didn't do exactly what I wanted for my voice. I think I might have just the wrong voice for it, and that is totally a thing. All microphones have different frequency responses, boosts, and dips in different areas, so different people's voices can work better or worse. Uh, I had Haley test it, and I really liked the clarity it brought to her voice. I have a loud enough voice I can push through this microphone. I mean, this is made to be on a stage yelling and singing in front of people. Uh, The microphone Haley's using is made to be, you know, radio, podcast, shows like that so i think it sounds great for her voice hopefully you think so as well uh the other change to the podcast is going to be next week again this is all through our patreon backers and their kind generation generations donations thank you guys uh next week i will be upgrading my computer processor uh which will make it easier for me to edit and record as well as Haley has talked about on episode 100 that we would like to try to stream more Uh, It will make streaming a lot simpler and easier to do on my system because I will have a processor that can truly handle everything. So I'm upgrading my processor. I've already flashed the BIOS on my motherboard several times to get it upgraded. And all I have to do now is get that processor in, flash it to its final where I need it to be, and then actually physically swap the processor. I'm very excited about it, but that's a big thank you to all of our patrons from patreon.com slash malthouse games for us being able to upgrade uh, hopefully this mic works for Haley. We'll test it out a little while, and then I will continue the lookout for which microphone fits my voice best. Probably this one, because I can't find one. Well, I, not that I can't find one. They're expensive, and <laughs> I need to be able to test them in my home, like three at a time, you know? Well. That's just tough to do. That's the problem, right? Yeah. You want to make an upgrade, but there's no way to just say, hey, can I borrow this for two days? record some stuff, send it back, I'll work with that audio. Not legally, at least. Not legally, at least. I think that's the last big announcement. Again, uh, if you want to be a patron to help us out and get one of those awesome 100th episode special beer glasses, uh, join in at the $5 or above tier. And once that charges October 1st, uh, as long as it is successful, you will be receiving one of those beer glasses once I collect an address from you. After that, you are free to continue or to cancel, depending on your heart's wishes. If you have any questions, concerns, comments, things of that sort, if you think Haley's voice is better than it was before, worse than it was before, or stayed the same, send an email, contact at malthousegames.com. This is what angels sound like. You can also find us on social media at Malthouse Games, M-A-L-T-H-A-U-S Games. You can find me personally at Delton Brack, D-E-L-T-O-N-B-R-A-C-K, You can find Haley at S-Q-U-I-R-R-E-L-Y-G-E-E-K. That is at Squirrely Geek. 
Uh, be sure to check out Rift Force that's going to be brought by Capstone Games. Be sure at the end of this month, I believe it was the 28th, to keep an eye out for Paleo Vet from Absurdus Productions, our local uh, game design company out of the Oklahoma City Metro. I think that that covers everything. Uh, I'm going to assume it does, and if I forget catch anything, I'll put it in post because editing. Editing. Uh, with that being said, I guess we're going to close it out. I'm feeling like I'm forgetting something, but anyway... Uh, thank you for tuning in to the Malt House Games Podcast, episode 101. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, sit back, relax, grab a drink, and play some games. We'll see you folks later. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.